Shea Bushu. Always, always. Great. Uh, so we're like, we haven't quite got halfway through the semester yet, but we're already getting uh, getting emails and fan mail. We actually got something for you this time. Really? Yes. Um, so this is, I love your class. I love DJ Bushu. Uh, I think you know this person. It says, I can't imagine my life without him. Please tell him that I forgive him uh, for everything he did, and I've changed my ways to... I don't care if he's not ready to settle down. It's, I, can you can you tell Timothy <laughs> to just Wait, tell him to just DM me on Twitter? Like it says, little pill. <laughs> I don't know who that is. That's that's his. Uh, this is like you know pen name. It sounds like a, is that a woman? It sounds like a woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know who that is. Okay. So for you guys in the class. Um, Homework two is going to be due uh, this co uh, coming up on, on the 25th. Uh, project one, again, is still due on October 2nd. Tonight, we'll have the Q&A session. Uh, I posted on Piazza. The link is on Zoom. Again, the idea is that we'll present sort of rough, high-level outline of what the project is about, uh, maybe some gotchas and things to watch out for, and then uh, there'll be a little chance for you to ask you know, some questions at the end. Okay? And so I'll just also just warn you, also say, uh, I'll remind this when project two comes out. Project two, project one will be much easier than project two. Project two will be very hard. Or well, not hard, but it'll be harder. Okay? All right, and then we'll have, again, the, the office hours will be on Saturday, October 1st, the, the day before it's due. Okay? All right, so uh, last class we talked about hash tables. And we talked about how they uh, were a data structure that's providing sort of an, an average, on average O1 access to, to items. But we saw, talked about how we have to deal with collisions, how we actually want to find the data that we're looking for uh, when, you know, because we can't have an infinitely sized hash table. We talked about how they can be used for internal metadata, like the page table in your buffer pool, how we can use them as like the core storage of the database system, temporary data structures, we'll, we'll see these when we do hash joins, and we talked a little bit about table indexes. So today, uh, we're going to focus most of our time on these B plus tree data structures, and they'll be most often going to be used for, for table indexes. So to remind everyone what, what table index essentially is, it's, it's you throw it as, as, a, as a replica or a copy of some portion of a table's attributes that are stored in a, in a specialized data structure that can be sorted or unsorted or organized in a certain way that allows us to find, to do efficient lookups, efficient access to find particular tuples that, uh, that have certain attributes with a certain values. Right, and the it's up to the database system's job to make sure that the contents of the table uh, and the contents of the index are synchronized. And I'll do this for you automatically. Like if you build an index and if I update a table, it'll automatically propagate those changes to the index. And we need to make sure that, that this is the case because we don't want to have any false negatives or false positives if we use an index to find data. And we don't want to delete something and then go look at the index and tell us that the item's still there. Right. So the, in, for all to be a transactional workloads, best case scenario is 99 or 100% of your queries will be using an index uh, in some way. If you ever have to fall back to do a scratch or scan, that's going to be super slow. So if you want really fast response times, you want to build indexes. For analytical workloads, you use indexes primarily for speeding up joins. Uh, and you'd use these for the you know, smaller tables, not, not, not the, the, your, your most largest tables. So we're not, we're not going to describe how the data is going to figure out what index to, to build or use for a query. Right? That's a whole other pr problem when we talk about query optimization. Right? For now, we can assume that something in the system magically picked pick the index that we want to use for our, our query. Um, now, what we're also, sorry, in our database system also too, in most database systems, they're not going to pick the indexes for you. You as the administrator, you as the user has to uh, figure out what indexes you actually want to have. Now, there is sort of this line of work of autonomous databases, the stuff that I work on. Uh, there are tools that use machine learning and other techniques to find what indexes you, you, sh you should have based on your workload. Right? This is a, one of the oldest problems in databases. It goes back to the 1970s. My advisor, advisor wrote one of the first papers on this in 1976. He's dead. Uh, actually, his daughter is actually in ISR, uh, Jessica Hammer. Um, but anyway, so, so like this is a really, really old problem. It's a, it, it, and, so Postgres isn't, isn't automatically going to figure out what indexes you need. Uh, you have to tell it what indexes you want. The enterprise systems and other tools can, can do this for you. 
And there's going to be this classic trade-off in computer science again. We see this, this, this reoccurring theme over and over again of storage versus compute overhead, right? So I can have a lot of indexes, and I can make almost you know, every query use it you know, really, really fast because I can, I can do lookups real quickly. But then I have to maintain them. Remember I said that the, the, the data system is going to make sure that the index is synchronized with the actual table. So every time I up, if I have a, you know, a thousand indexes on a table, every time I update that table, I have to update a thousand indexes. So to come up with the right trade-off for, for the speeding up queries versus the, ma the maintenance problem, again, this is, this is sort of outside the scope of what we're talking about today. We, we're going to talk about, like, if you call create index, what do you actually get? And nine times out of ten, it's going to be a, a B-plus tree. All right, so first we're going to have an overview on what a B-plus tree actually is. And then we'll talk about how we can use it in a data system, the different design choices we have actually building it. And if we have time, we'll finish up with some, some more common optimizations you can, you can do go beyond what the, uh, I think what the textbook discusses and what the, the, you know, the, the literature back in the 70s discusses, certainly. So the first thing we have to address is what the hell it actually is a, a B, B tree, a B plus tree. So sort of the confusing thing is that there is a specific category of, of data structures called B plus trees. But then there's actually one data structure called a, 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 sorry, there's a category of data structures called B trees. And then there's one data structure that is specifically a B tree. But the B, B plus tree is in this family of, of B tree data structures, right? And a lot of times in database systems, when you look at uh, like documentation and the literature of what a data system says they actually support, they'll say they're going to be using a B tree, but the, looking at it, they're almost always using a B plus tree. If you go look at the Postgres code, they talk about using a B tree, but it really is actually a, a B plus tree when you look when you look at the documentation, right? So the original B tree goes back to 1971. The the B plus tree that we'll talk about here, there isn't an exact date. Uh, it's, it's alluded to that this is from 1973. So there's this paper that everyone else cites. Everyone cites. If you want like to consider what the original B plus tree paper is, this one, the ubiquitous B trees. Again, they're using B tree, but they're actually describing B plus trees. Um, and this is from the IBM people, and they mentioned in this that there's a some IBM tech report from like '73 that describes the original B plus tree, um, but I, I, I'm not able to find that. Um, and then there's these other ones like B link tree, the B star tree, there's the B epsilon tree, there's a whole bunch of these other B trees. Um, and the modern incarnation of a B plus tree is actually going to borrow bits and pieces from from all of them, right? So the B link tree was actually invented here at CMU uh, by Phil Lehman, who is in, he's still in the, uh, he works in the Dean's office in, in the CS department, or SES. Um, so his tree, the B link tree, actually has sibling pointers between the, the leaf nodes. The original B plus tree doesn't have that, but most B plus trees are gonna have that now. Right, so again, you'll, you'll see this as we go along. I'll, I'll try to say, here's the bits and pieces that are borrowed from different data structures, but it, at a high level, the B plus tree will be what I'm describing here, but it's not the original definition back in the 1970s, right? So the other thing too is like the the original guys at IBM that invented uh, invented the B tree, the B plus tree, never actually defined what B is. Actually, I take that back. The B plus tree was not invented at IBM; it was, it was other dudes. Um, they never explained what actually B what the B meant, right? They actually built the first version at Boeing in their research labs. Uh, so some say, oh, maybe it means, means Boeing. Uh, it could mean balanced, broad, bushy, Bayer, the guy's name, right? Like, it's never been defined, but I usually think of it as, as a balanced tree. All right, so again, we're going to be focusing today on a B plus tree, but with sort of accoutrements from, from the other ones. So a B plus tree is going to be a self-balancing uh, tree data structure that's going to keep the, the, the keys that it's storing in sorted order and we're not going to describe what, what that order is, but that's called a collation, right? So then sometimes it's characters in different languages, sort of different order. For our purposes here, we're going to assume English alphabetical ordering. And so it's going to allow us to do efficient lookups, deletes, and assertions, and always log in, right? Meaning we can always find, uh, traverse the tree and find whatever we're looking for and do whatever it is that we need to do in log in. Um, so it's a generalization of, of a binary search tree in that we're going to allow us to have more than two children uh, per node, right? In the, in the original binary search tree, like it's always was well, binary, it's two, right? And the data structure is going to be designed to optimize the amount of sequential access we can do on large blocks. Remember, this is invented back in the 1970s. Memory was super constrained. Disks were super slow. 
and there was a huge difference between random access and sequential access. So they were trying to design a data structure that maximized the amount of sequential access you could do when you, when you did lookups, right? And, but it turns out, even though it's in, modern, in uh, the modern era, where SSDs are getting you know, much faster, random access is, is not as that much slower than, than sequential access, it's still the right data structure to use in, in most cases. So the, the way, for more formally to say is that B plus tree is going to be an M-way search tree with the following properties. So first is that it's going to be perfectly balanced, meaning the, every leaf node in our data structure will be the, always the same distance, the same number of hops from the root. That's why we can guarantee log and lookups for everything. Um, and the way it's going to work is we're going to say that the way this is going to say that every uh, every node other than the root has to be at least half full, uh, meaning the the you take the number of keys that you have, if you divide it by, and either take the ceiling or the floor, the, the exact the exact version doesn't matter, but you're guaranteeing that you at least have half you you have at least half a number of keys filled in your node at every level. The root you can be uh, a bit loosey goosey with this. And again, depending on the implementation, some may, might choose different things. In the end, it doesn't actually matter, as long as we're guaranteeing that it's, it's log n all the way down. All right? All right, so let's look at a really simple example here. So this would be a two-level uh, B plus tree. Um, and we have at the top, we have, or we have the leaf nodes, we have the, and the inner node. In this case here, it's only two levels, so this is also the root node. And you're going to have these simply pointers in the leaf nodes that once we get down to the bottom, we can actually go back and forth along, scan along the leaf nodes without potentially having to go back up, right? Because this will matter when we, in the next class when we talk about how to do multi-threading operations on this. We want to avoid threads going in uh, opposite directions because then we, we can have deadlocks. Now, if you want to go along, along leaf nodes that you, you can have deadlocks, uh, we'll see how to handle that next class. And so the composition of, the, of each node is these sort of key value pairs, where you would have a, uh, within a node, you would have this array of key values. And then the, between each key value pair, you would have this pointer to another node that would say which direction you would go down below, right? So along, uh, at this top node here, we have five and nine. So before five, we have a pointer to the node, the, the leaf node down here. Uh, and so the, since the key is five, the pointer would point us down to a node where we're guaranteed that it would only contain keys with that are whose value is or keys who the key is less than five. I don't want to say value because the value could be, you know, a pointer to to a to a to, a, to pointer to the tuple. We want to skip that for now, right? And then after five, you have another pointer it says less than nine. So that's guaranteeing that any keys found down here and to the right of it, uh, or to the left of it, will be also less than less than nine. And at the last one, uh, you say it's anything great, greater than or equal to nine, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, yes. Sorry, is this always a, like a, are you a path of tree, or is this just like a for de like demonstration? Is it, sorry, is this what? Sorry. Is it always because it's like the, it seems as if like it's an, always an array of size three. Oh, your question is like, I'm showing this as an array of size three. So you would say it's it's a. Officially, you would say this is a, a B plus tree with a degree of four, meaning it has three keys and four pointers or outer, outer edges coming from it. This is a really simplistic example to make it fit on PowerPoint. Yeah. In actuality, the size, we'll get to this. I mean, it could be a 10 megabyte node, it could be, and, you know, kilobytes. And the number of keys will depend on the size of what the keys you're actually storing. Yes. Her statement is, her question is, everything less, at this, po this point here, everything uh, for this point or here going down is guaranteed to be the less than nine. Yes. So the, again, the composition at the leaf nodes now, since we don't have to have pointers to other nodes, we actually have now a pointer to the value that corresponds to this key, right? And if you're using this as the table index, it's going to be the record ID. Like the page number, uh, the page number at an offset or slot number. Yes. The question is, if I have a value for five, where would it go in this case here? Uh, it would go here. 
right? Because this is everything less than five. If I actually had the key five, it would go here. So you would also have a small, or you'd also have a key of five there again. So you would fill in the answer. Yeah, so, so she should pick up a good point. I have, this, I have five here, uh, but it's actually not a key in the data structure. I think it's, it's like a guide, guide post up above that says if you're looking for this key, you're looking for keys in this value, go left and right of me. But the B plus tree does not require you to have the values, uh, that, like any value that, that's in an inner node above the leaf nodes does not have to exist in the leaf nodes. So in this example here, like again, I, I, it's, I'm pre-set pre up for you for demonstration purposes, but it, in order to have five there, I would have to insert it five, and then at some later point I deleted it. So I'd have to delete it from the leaf nodes to say it no longer exists, but it could still exist up in the inner nodes. Yes? Uh, would four have to be in the leftmost leaf node, or could it be in the lowest node? His, his question is, in my example here, would, if I insert four, where would it go? It would have to go here, because it's less than five. I mean, but it's also less than nine. Yeah, but it's, I, just, I meant to say here, like, for this edge right here, th this is less than nine, right? Uh, but like the way you would do the do the comparison, you would go from left to right. So you would look to say, is four less than five? Yes, go down this edge. Yes. Can you elaborate again why this is degree four? It's degree four because there's four. It's, it, there could be at four at most four outer edges coming out of each node. So in my example here, I have three, right? So these little like thinner parts here, these are the pointers going out. So you have one, two, three, four. Yeah, so you wouldn't have to change the, the root node. You might have to change what, what guidepost keys it has in it. Uh, but yeah, it could potentially, could potentially look like that. Yes? Does every leaf node have to be the same size or could it be variable? This question is, does every leaf node have to be the same size or could it be variable size? So same size in terms of like the number of keys they could store? Yeah. Uh, does it, I don't, I don't know if it has to be, but you, you want it to be because it makes your life way easier. Right, because then you don't have to deal with like a deallocated page. I got I, I have fragment, fragmentation in my disk or in memory. All right, so every node itself is going to be this, comprised of these key value pairs. And as I said, the keys are derived from whatever the attribute I want to build the index on. So if I call create index on, on column ABC, the, the, the keys that are being stored are the values of ABC for every, every tuple, right? And then the values could differ based on whether it's classified as inner node or leaf node, as I, s I said to her question. Like I could delete a key, uh, and so that I have to remove it from the leaf node because if it's in a leaf node, it has to exist in my set that I'm trying to trying to map. Uh, but I could maintain it in the upper nodes. Right? There sort of could be a remnant of a key that used to exist in the upper parts because it's for, for the time being it, it allows us to, to figure out where we want to go left, left or right. And typically the arrays uh, of the key value pairs we sort of in key order. Doesn't have to be, uh, but you can do this. Uh, it, it simplifies things when you do lookups because you can do binary search to find what you're looking for very quickly. We'll talk about index and currency control uh, next class, but think of, think of I basically have to take a latch on the entire page of a leaf node uh, or a, any node while I'm traversing it. So I want to be in and out as quickly as possible. Yes? So you said like base of a leaf node. Are we generally thinking about it as like each node is going to be like the size of a page? Your statement is. Uh, should we generally think about this as like every node is the size of a page? Yes. And that's why you, you can have in the, the enterprise databases, you can specify that you want larger page sizes for index, the index buffer pool, because sometimes you want a larger page size for indexes. All right, again, here's the, here's the inner contents of a, uh, of a leaf node. So you have, again, your, your, your key value pairs of, um, of uh, keys and values. And at, at, the, at the end here, you have a pointer to the, to the previous node and a pointer to the next node. Um, and then you get, again, just key value pairs that are alternating. So this is one way to, to do this. Um, you can also organize it as separate, uh, se se separate arrays. Uh, typically, it's done this. Like, again, there's trade-offs between doing this. Uh, on one hand, it's an extra hop to go, go from here to here to find the key that you're trying to looking for. Uh, Otherwise, or it's like, this is an extra hop, but if you put them in line or one after another, alternating, then like you kind of screw up your cache lines. We can ignore all that for now. But you also store some additional metadata, like what level you are in the tree, 
uh, how many free slots you have, and then the, the next and left order. Different database systems you know, organize pages in different ways. There's trade-offs for, for all these things. So the values themselves uh, could either be the record IDs, as I said, page number and offset to go allow find the, to find the tuple that you're looking for. Um, but it could actually actually be the, the tuples themselves. So in some database systems, the leaf nodes will actually be like the slotted pages that we talked about before, where we're actually going to store tuples. So when I traverse the index, and when I get to a leaf node, when I try to find the tuple I'm looking for, I don't have to do another lookup to the page table and say, give me that page number and offset, or give me that page number. The data you want is, is already there. Right? So I, I, I call these index organized tables. Um, for number two, you'd use this for the primary key indexes, because otherwise you'd be duplicating data and it's unnecessary. So different database systems do different things. So the first approach where the, key, the value is actually the record ID, that's what Postgres does and, 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 and you know, SQL Server, DB2, and Oracle. But having the, the, the data actually in the leaf nodes of the index, that's what MySQL does by default. The probably the most famous one that does this. SQLite does it as well. In SQL Server and Oracle, you can actually specify for each table whether you want to be index organized or not. The default is it's not, uh, but they do allow support for this. Right? So again, in MySQL, when I do a lookup on the primary key, I'm going to traverse a B plus tree like we're talking about here. But when I land in that leaf node, there's the tuple ID to immediately. Right? And I don't have to do an extra, extra lookup. And there's pros and cons for, 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 these, for these different approaches. Right? So one con would be um, for any secondary index that's not the primary key in MySQL, the value is actually not going to be a record ID. The value is actually going to be the entire primary key. So I, so I do a lookup at MySQL on a secondary index. I get to the leaf node. It gives me the primary key. Then I do another probe in the primary key index to get the tuple I want. Where in Postgres, if I do a secondary index lookup, I land at the bottom, I get the record ID, and then I can just go jump immediately get the data that I want. Yes? You can only have one index that uses it, it's typically the primary key. Yeah, so that's my example. If I, in, in MySQL, if I have secondary indexes, the value will actually be the primary key value. So I do a secondary index lookup, I get the primary key, then do a second probe in the primary key index to get the two by one. Yes? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit hard trying to see the, down, like the downside to the first approach. Then. Isn't it just better to always start with constant then? Because in that situation, like secondary directory, you always get. His statement is, statement is what, what is the downside of the first, what is, what, is, what is the possible downside of the first approach versus the second one? Yeah, is it just, is it just because like, if, I, if I want, if the, the one extra step of going to a pointer? Yeah, so I mean, so this is the, this is the problem with databases. The, the answer is it depends, right, for everything. Uh, if I only do primary key lookups, the MySQL way is better because I don't have to do the extra lookup, right? If I do a lot of secondary key end lookups, then the Postgres one is actually better. There's actually a blog article I can post it on Piazza. Uh, we we'll might cover this later in the semester. Um, from, from Uber Engineering, where they, they were using Postgres, and they hired somebody who really liked MySQL, so they switched their database over to MySQL, and then because of this particular problem here, they had to go switch back to Postgres. Right? So they paid millions. Like, instead of paying millions of dollars for engineers to switch it, they could have asked me, and I said, use Postgres. I don't have enough. Like, like this, this is a good example. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on them. They have really smart people, of course. But like, it's a good example. If you don't understand the internals of the database systems, you may make design decisions for your particular application or workload like, th that are just completely wrong, and things get worse than you, than you think it is. There might have been other reasons why they wanted to switch to, to MySQL, right? But for their particular workload, as they describe it in that blog article, Postgres is the way to go. All right. So. I talked a little bit at the beginning. What's the difference between a B, B tree and a B plus tree? So in the original B tree from 1972, they're going to store the key and the values in any node in the tree, both inner and, and, and the leaf nodes, right? So this is more space efficient because every key will appear once and only once in your data structure. The downside is that if you have to do a sequential scan now, uh, or a range scan in, in, in sorted order based on the key, now you're basically jumping up and down the tree, and you're jumping across diff different pages over and over again. Where in, in a B plus tree, since the, the values are always in the leaf nodes, once we traverse and get to the bottom, we can then potentially scan, just scan along the leaf nodes using the sibling pointers, 
to find all the data that we're looking for. There may be some scenarios we'll see in a second where you may actually want to sort of do a, uh, almost like a breath first search. You sort of get to one level, go down, come back up. Uh, but in most cases, you can get to the bottom and just scan across. All right? Yes? I think of like a so it's your statement is why would you have to bounce around in a B, B tree uh, if you just if you're looking if you're doing a point query meaning finding one thing yeah. then yes you go, you go find one thing. Oh, but if you're if you're doing a range scan then you have to jump jump around. All right, so let's see actually how, how we build one. So to do the insert, we're going to find the correct leaf, leaf node that we want. Again, doing that traversal, looking at the, the guideposts to tell us whether we want to go left or right. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we get to the leaf node. Uh, we want to sort the, the new key entry, the new value in, in sorted order. So if our leaf node has enough space, then we just insert it and we're done. If it doesn't have any more space, then we have to split it and, and create a new node. Right? And there's sort of two approaches for this. So one, <laughs> we can try to, to copy, uh, you know, move some, some, some half of the nodes over, uh, maybe re reorganize a little bit. But when we do this, because we now another leaf node, we have to update our parent leaf or parent node to now include a new guidepost uh, key so that, with a pointer so that other people can find now where we're going, right? And then when we want to split an inner node, you basically do the same thing, but you're always pushing, pushing up the middle key and splitting things in half. So the drawing this in, in PowerPoint would be a huge pain. Uh, so I'm actually going to use this, this, this uh, demonstration from this other professor. But this is actually a fork of it uh, that has, has changed some things. So let's start really, really simple here. So we're going to start one, goes like that. Start three, goes like that. I'll say also we're max degree three. So that means we have three, we can have three edges coming out of it, every, every node. But we're going to store two, two keys per node. All right, so now I'll insert two. What's going to happen here? It's going to, it's, it's, I only have one level, so it says, ah, oh, hey, this, the first node is where I need to go. But because I've already have two keys in there, I can't insert it. So we're going to have to split it. All right? And so it picked the middle key, two, and put all values less than two to the left of it, which is just one all values greater than or equal to 2 to the right of it, which is 2 and 3. Right? So far, so good? All right, so let's keep going. Let's put in a, a 6. Right, that would go here. That's too big. We have to split that. Right, so it bubbled up 3. So now, again, the, the, the first key, the root, is 2. So all values uh, less than 2 go to the right of it, so the left of it. Then the next key, the root, is 3. So all values less than three go to the right, of the left of that, which is just two, and then the last edge would be all values greater than equal, greater than equal to three, so three and six. So let's keep going, and we'll, we'll insert on the uh, on the right side of the tree. So we'll insert nine. Then we have to split that, right? That was a little. Let me go back. That was a little fast. Uh, what's that? Say it again. So we're going to start. Yeah, I turned down the animation. Yeah, make it go slow. So we're going to start nine. And so, again, okay, we're going to check the root. We say, all right, nine is greater than greater than or equal to three. So we've got to go down here. This is our leaf node. This we know this is where we want to insert, but we already have two keys in there, so we can't insert. So now we got to split it. But when we split it, we're going to move up six because that's the middle key. But when it goes up here and our and our, our node above it, that's going to be full. So now we got to split that. And then that's going to create a new level for us, because uh, we have to create a new, new, uh, new parent above, above, above the uh, original root. So we insert nine. Goes down here. Can't do that. That pops up. Can't go there. That pops up. And three goes to the root. Yes. This question is: Can the root be one or two or more elements, uh, or can it be more? It would be, to his question before, it would be the same size yeah. as all the ones. So in this case here, degree of three means I have two keys per node. So I have, so I have two keys. Yeah, it depends on the size. Of, of like, it depends on the degree that you set up for, for your nodes. 
Yes. The question is, uh, the degree is 3, meaning uh, when the size is 3, it splits. The degree being, it's a, like from graph theory, the degree means like the number of edges coming out of it. So I get most, at most 3 edges coming out of it. So, but it, so if I try to start another key, I would need 4 edges coming out of it, and that, that violates my degree restraint. Yes? So when I say when a degree has to, when a when a when a node has to be at least half full, do I mean it in terms of degrees or number of keys? A degrees is number of keys plus one is number of keys plus one per node. It says it's basically the same thing. So like again, starting with degree three, meaning two keys per node, like if you have one key, it's it's half full and that's enough, right? So we can switch this to be degree of four. If you have three keys, we can see what that looks like when we do splits later. Yes. Yeah, so it's, so it's question is, if, if your degree is even like degree four, you could have arbitrary middle keys. What would you choose? Again, this is where like the, the exact one you would pick doesn't matter. But I would say as long as you're consistent in your implementation, which most systems would be or should be. Yes? Would you see an example of a larger degree and like way more keys in the primitive? Sure. So he says, do you want to see a larger key? All right, so we'll do, we'll do one. Mm. Oh, with a slash. All right, clear that. Sorry. One, two, let me jack up just to be a little bit. Four, right, degree of four means I can, I can have three keys. Now I'm going to assert six. It's, it's, it's not going to have any space, so it's, it's going to have to split it, and it's going to make, make a new level down below, right? Keep going. Eight. Let's pick three, right? So we'll do, now I'll assert three. Three is less than four, so it should, should, should go to the one on the left. Right? Zero. Right, so, zero, so we insert zero. It's going to go, zero is less than four, so it's going to go to the left. Once I insert it where the, the, the where it says node zero, it says one, two, three, it's not going to have any room there, so it's going to have to split it. And then now it's going to pick the middle key and then move, move that up to the root. Right? Keep going, or are we good? Okay. You have to balance yourself at some point. Say it again? You have to balance yourself at some point. It's balanced right now. Will we ever have a skewed key if we keep improving the balancing? Or Which the definition of skewed is what? That every node is not imbalanced. Every node is what, sorry? Like there's some imbalance in the balancing of the key. That's No, no, no. So his question is can you ever have a imbalance where the distance of a leaf node to the root is not the same? No. By definition, it can't. So with this implementation scheme, we never even have to balance our key. Uh, it will just always be balanced. Because I, I remember for like other tree structure, we have to go for the child to keep the tree balance. Right? Yeah, so the same as like for other data structures, you have to do rotations to get things to balance. No. Like it's always going to be. If you follow the protocol, the algorithm, how to do, maintain a B plus tree, it's always balanced. It's, it's self balancing. Yes? How do you decide which key is the middle key when there are four elements? So, so his question, same, your question is the same thing as his. How do I, if I have four elements, how do I decide which one is the middle key? It doesn't matter, right? Pick, pick the, the, the first one or the second one. As long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. So his question is, do I, is the purpose of the sibling pointer is to do redistribution? No, the purpose of the sibling po pointer is to do scans along leaf nodes. Because okay. otherwise I got to go back up. Okay. Yes? Um, does the order of insertion matter for the structure of the tree? Yes, it does. So perfect question. So his question is, does the order of uh, insertion affect the construction of the tree? Yes. So I, like, it may be the case I insert things in one order versus another. I will have, it's no guarantee that certain keys will be in the same nodes. Tries actually do have that property. So no matter what order you insert the keys in a try, 
they will always be the same like physical layout in the data structure. In B plus trees, it's not the case. It's like the hash tables, right? If I insert this key versus the other one, if they're all, they both hash the same slot, whichever one I insert first will land in that slot first, ignoring Robinhood and all that other stuff. Yes. So you're saying if I split on, sorry. Uh, you mentioned we can use either of the two, two elements uh, as long as they're consistent, right? Uh, to split. Yes. So if you split on one instead of two, which we've done right now, you would have zero on, on the left node and one, two, and three on the right node. Uh, yeah, so your statement is if, if, I, if I decided to split on one instead of two before, then I would have a, uh, in this case, three, three. No, because you wouldn't do that because then this would have only one key in it and it'd be unbe. Yeah, you make yeah. Save it is you need to make sure that the property that that the after a split, the two two leaf nodes you're creating, are both have at least half half the number of keys. Yes. Well, the complexity guarantee is always log n, no matter what. Right, the, I would think it not so much, so statement is if I, if I, if I like, we'll see a bulk load in a second. If I insert my keys first and then insert them in sort of order, yeah. what, what do I get from that? Right. So in, there is a notion of like the fill factor of the nodes, meaning uh, within a page, if I go fetch from disk, how many keys am I gonna have in there, mm -hmm. right? And because we're trying to keep things at least half full and like we're, 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 we're doing this on the fly, on, on average, I think in, in real life data sets, the occupancy of a, a B plus tree node is like 69%. So that means you have roughly 21% of the data is, is empty. Mm -hmm. So there are commands in SQL called optimize. There's a, you, say, you can call optimize on, a, on an index. Not all data sets will support this. That basically does compaction. It gives you the minimum size uh, B plus tree you would need. Okay. So you, you could, so with bulk loading, you could do that. You could, you could not all systems support this, but you could bulk load the, if you sort all the data ahead of time, then to build the B plus tree, and you actually build it from the, the bottom to the top, rather than from the top to the bottom. Um, if you do that, then you can at least have 100% uh, fill rate occupancy of all your nodes. Okay. Yes. Um, if you could uh, use an example where we're adding duplicate keys. Uh, well, his question is, can we, can we, can we see duplicate, how they handle duplicate keys? I'll get that in a second. This one, it'll, it'll just do it. Nothing, nothing, nothing fancy will happen, right? Ew. Yeah, it was right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do the comparison. Uh, in a, we'll see how we actually we do this in in, in, a, in a real data system. This, no, there's no perfect. This is the best people people street visualization I can find. Yes. If there's a node with just a single number, how do you create an upper node? What do you mean? We'll come back to duplicate values in a second. All right, let's keep going. All right, so deletes, um, same idea. We, we, we start at the root, do a traversal, looking at the, those guidepost markers. We get to a leaf node. You find the entry you want to delete if it exists. If the leaf node is at least half full, we delete it and we're done. If it's now less than half full, then we have to we have to rebalance things, right? And the first approach is you could try to steal uh, steal steal a key from from your neighbors, right? As long as they have the same parent node as you, um, and you may have to update the 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 the, the splitter uh, key up above in your parent. If you can't do that, then you have to pick one of your siblings uh, to merge it with. And then remove remove one of the out, out out degrees or out edges coming out from the from the node above you, right? So the the challenge about this is that the merge could actually propagate all all the way back up to the root, and you got to collapse the height of the of the of the of the of the tree. It's almost it's almost like rebuilding it from scratch. All right, so let's go back here. So let's delete. Let's go back. 
and get that extra two. So let's delete three, right, for the middle. Now when I do this, uh, the middle node will be unbalanced now, right? It will have less than half, half a number of entries. So I think in this visualization, they're going to try to steal from their neighbors. So they're going to try to maybe steal from the, 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 the rightmost one with four, six, eight. Right, so we go ahead and delete two. Ah, stole from that guy. It's not wrong, right? Just did it, did it, ch chose, chose to go from the left instead of the right. All right? I, I think it doesn't try to, try to, it doesn't try to merge with anybody. Right? Yes, I was saying, yeah, so like, yeah, so if I delete here, if I, I'm going to delete three, this node is now unbalanced because it's going to have less than, less than half full. So instead of having to, uh, I mean, instead of, like, is this merging or is this, is this stealing, right? It, no, sorry, it's stealing. So it takes from this guy. No, I take it back. It's merging. So it decided that it's going to, this thing needs to, this two now needs to go over to here and it has, has to update the, the, the key up above, right? So let's do this again. Delete three. Three goes away. It decides to, to merge those two, All right? So now let's keep going. Let's say I, so I delete four. That's fine, right? Oh, it was very aggressive. I tried, tried to try to rebalance everything. <laughs> yeah, because the root you can you can play games. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. All right, so question: Why not put it? So, again, like this, whatever this thing is actually implementing, it's, it doesn't follow the textbook, right? Because I showed before, it had, you know, it has to have at least two entries, but it left the root with one entry. They decided, let's go packing more up in there. Yes. So when, when it merged, it couldn't actually borrow from the text. So here, going back here, when I, when I merge... This one here. Yeah. So if I, if I deleted three. But you'd have to update this thing too. Yes. Yes. Again, from the implementation standpoint, you would actually already have the latch on your parent anyway. Okay. So, so we'll talk about this in the next class. So like you have the latch on your parent, so you already have, you know, you already have exclusive access to it. So it doesn't cost you anything to go update it because you've already you're already blocking for anybody from touching it. Yes. You, you mentioned like you need latches on all your parents all the way down. So like if you ever do anything. Let, let's cover let's cover that next class. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so statement is if I steal from my sibling, uh, could that could my sibling have become unbalanced? Yes, so therefore you don't want to steal from them, and you just you just merge. Actually, in this case here, if I if I if I store actually negative one, right, that should go over here. Now this case, now if I delete three, oh, yeah, whatever. Again, this is the best I can get. Okay, so if I delete th if I delete three now, it should steal from from the neighbor. All right, let's ignore this. This thing's fucked up. <laughs> Go with the textbook. <laughs> I said, I, this one's a fork. So the, the original one is from this guy in San Francisco. I don't know who this dude is. And I, I use this one because he, he made a drop down. I, I thought he improved it. He made a drop down instead of having like the ch whatever check boxes. The original, we can take this offline. There's a, the original guy is the, is, this dude here. So if you find his webpage, he has the original one. Anyway, all right, let's keep going. All right, so doing lookups now. So I've showed examples where we have these guide posts that tells us where something's less than or greater than or equal to, and that tells us to go left and right. Uh, and that's pretty simple if you have one, one key or one attribute in, in your key. But you can do, you actually do some tricky things having uh, partial lookups when you have multiple keys or multiple columns in your key. So a simple example, I have an index on columns A, B, and C in my table. 
So I could do uh, a conjunction where I say a equals 1 and b equals 2 and c equals 3. And I know how to do that traversal, again, use, using those guideposts to find the data that I'm looking for. But you also can do partial key lookups. So I can do a lookup on a and b without c. And that still works because we just assume c is a wild card and we'll take anything as long as a and b matches. But then I also can do uh, suffix lookups as well, where I can have just b or just c or just b and c without a, and I can still do, do that lookup. Now, that, that last one's kind of tricky, and not everyone supports, supports that one. But in general, I mean, you have to have the, the I have all the keys, do the lookup. Um, you can have either quality predicates or you know, range, range predicates on partial, some of the keys. But only not having the, the, you know, the first key, set of keys in your, in your list of uh, attributes, again, not, not everyone supports that. And so this differs from the hash index stuff that we talked about last class. If we, I'm sorry, hash tables are using as, as an index, because I have to take the key and I hash it, and that tells me wh where, where to jump to in, in my hash table. And so if I don't have all the attributes that I need to do my lookup on, then my hash is, is essentially meaningless, right? So this is one advantage you would have using a B plus tree over, over a hash table for indexes. And of course, B plus trees can handle like non-equality predicates, range scans, not, not equals, and you can't do that in a hash index. Yes? So in the example, when you read the page two, the page two, um, it says it started on A first, and you have to check for all A and B. Yeah, the, we'll come to that, right? So let's look at some examples. So here's the first one. We have, we have an index on uh, A and B, and so we want to do a lookup. We'll find, find key where, the, we're sorry, we have two columns, column one, column two. And we're going to do a lookup where uh, the first column equals A and the second column equals, equals B, right? So even though there's not multiple keys, uh, we just do comparison in order one after another. So the first one we say is A less than equal to A and is B less than equal to C? Yes. So we know we, we just go down to this edge here and find the data that we're looking for, right? If we have now A followed by a wild card, right? So in this case here, we know A is less than equal to A. So we just traverse down to the leaf node here. And then now we scan across the, the leaf nodes until we find a, a key that violates the predicate is, is, or is less than equal to A, right? So once, once we reach the first B, since A, is le, a, a star is less than B star, less than equal to B star, we know we can stop here. And we don't need to scan all the way down. Yes? But like, how do we know, how do we build up the value that the key is pointing to? How do you build up the value that the key is pointing to? What do you mean? Like, because if, like if we're only select one attribute, then that's pretty straightforward, right? Yes. Just the attribute. But if we have multiple attributes, um, I guess we just do a search for it, maybe? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not following what you're saying, sorry. Yeah, I, I feel like it's just the same thing. Yeah, I mean, just think of like, again, like, uh, like column zero equals find me find me find me all key find me all keys where column zero or column one equals a, and then take anything for column two, right? So as long as I see column a column one equal a, I keep scanning until I see something where column one does not equal a, then I stop because again they're in sorted order at the leaf nodes, so I know that once I find the first thing where it doesn't equal a, then there can't be anything else in another leaf node that could, could match my predicate, and therefore I can stop, oh. right? Yes? Why is AC? Uh, question is, why is AC in the second node? Because uh, AC, this AC is less than equal to this AC. The, these are values. A and C are values of col yeah, column one, column two. I should be, should be more clear. All right, so the last one is this one here, where I, I only have a partial, right? So I'm trying to find where I don't have a, I don't have the value of column one, but I want column uh, column two to equal a. Now this one's pretty tricky or pretty stupid because it's it's only a two level tree, right? You basically have to search for everything, right? Uh, but you actually can't do uh, the scratchable scan that we saw before. You actually need to do multiple traversals down to the leaf nodes, uh, and then scan just that node to find what you're looking for. Right, because you don't know, you don't know, wouldn't know when to stop. In this example here, again, it's stupid because it's only a two-level tree, uh, 
you just you could just jump to the, the leftmost node and scan across to find everything, which is the same thing as, as a sequential scan. So let me do a, a more, more sophisticated example here. So now I have index on column one, column two, column three. Uh, and then the values that I can have, possibly have for these columns are, are either A, B, C, or D. Right? And I'm going to do a lookup now where column equals B, or column two equals B. So this is a gross uh, diagram. It has small, small, again, this is why it's hard to show these things in, in, a, in PowerPoint because things get real packed. But the main takeaway I want to show you is that I start here at the top. Uh, and I know that I want to do a lookup where B, uh, where column two equals B. So I just go down to the first, the, the next level, and I would do my lookup here. Now I'm trying to find where AAA uh, inclusive up to ABA exclusive. And that would tell me that I know that it could never be anything down here because I'm trying to find where, uh, where, where B, column two equals B. So therefore, I don't need to look down here. But for this one here, since I do have something with the B in the second column, I do need to look at this one. So we sort of get the, 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 the level right above the leaf nodes. I'm trying to figure out, could there ever be anything below me? And if not, then I can just skip it. And I just do the, keep just doing this down all the way down for all these. Uh, skip this one. And just traverse all the way down. Right? So the idea is, again, you're just using these markers up here to decide whether I need to jump down down below. Yes? I mean, the sibling yeah. pointers. Sorry? Showing the sibling pointers? Yeah, the sibling pointers, yeah. So is there an example where we actually use the pointer to the previous sibling instead of the next one? Like, or the oh, so your question is, uh, uh, let me go back to here. This one didn't have siblings. Your question is, is, is there an example where I would jump down to the bottom and follow along the leaf nodes here? In, in reverse direction? Yeah. All right, so the question is, um, I've always shown you going, let's go left and right. Would we ever go right to left? Yeah, so if I'm trying to find all values uh, less than some key lookup, right, like a between range, it may be better to start over here and then go backwards. And that's completely controlled by the uh, system. The right? question is, is that controlled by the data system? It's like, is the data system going to figure that out for us? Yes. That's like a few more weeks. That's like SQL query shows up. What, how, how do I translate that into a query plan I want to execute? We're still like sort of like, okay, assuming something else figures out how they want to use us, how, how, how do we expose this data structure to them? Yes? Uh, are there sibling pointers between internal nodes? So question is, are there sibling pointers between internal nodes? Typically, no. Because you don't, you, you, Although it can help some scenarios, well, I say it it complicates things because of deadlocks. Like I could be going this way, you could be going this way, and so if you just restrict it to be on the leaf nodes, you you avoid like you have to handle it, but you know there's not some kind of weird thing of people going in different directions up and down. Uh, for the example that you just showed with the um, the skip scan, the skip scan. Yes. Uh, when you're going between the like data tables. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, the question is in this example here, because I, I, I actually want to look at all of these and do the same sort of analysis. Uh, how do I get back? How do I get from here to here? You would go back up. Actually, take it back. You would restart, right? Because you, you never, you don't want to go back up unless you already hold the latch for something. And so, if you like the optimization for scans, you try to release the latch as soon as possible. We'll cover this next class. So if you don't have the latch for your parent, you just start over and start from the root. So if you want to do like a normal linear scan, do you find like the first node that works and the last node that works and then just use the sibling pointers for both of these? So this question is, uh, to do a range scan, would I tra traverse once, find the starting point, traverse again to find the stopping point, and then just figure out the scan along those? Why would I need to know the stopping point? Right? I traverse once, and then I have some a, some predicate that says stop when this thing's no longer true, and I scan along until I stop. Until I stop. All right, there's a lot of things that we want to cover, and we're short on time, so I'm, uh, we may have to overflow into ne next class. That's okay. All right, uh, we came up with how do we handle duplicate keys? 
And I mentioned this last class and I misspoke. I said you could do this for hash tables and you can't because you need to have the whole key for the hash, hash for the hash, uh, to use a hash table for it, for an index. But a really common trick you would use with the B plus tree, since we can do these prefix lookups where we just have a portion of the key. Um, if you if you want to support unique that or sorry non unique keys, then all you do is just, you just put the uh, the record ID of the tuple you, you want to point to as the last key uh, or last last attribute in the key of your of your of your index. So I have an index on on column one. If I want to make sure it's, that's not that it can handle non unique keys. It's, it's underneath the covers, it's really column one followed by the, the record ID. Like in Postgres, it was that CTI th D thing. And that guarantees that no matter if you insert the same key over and over again, as long as it's not for the exact same tuple, it's always going to be unique. And because I can do record ID lookups, or sorry, I can do partial key lookups or prefixes, I can just, you know, I can just do my lookup on that, that first column and I'll get back all the... Uh, I'll get back all, all the tuples that, that match it. Another approach, which is not, not as common, but you could do this, is do over, overflow leaf nodes. You basically just support duplicate keys, but instead of having to change the um, change the, the, the guideposts and the inner nodes above you, you sort of append them as a, as a linked list going, going down. And that sort of violates the, the log n stuff that we talked about before. Uh, yeah, but but it's one way to do it. And again, it's a constant factor. Does it matter? Yes. But like, if, if you don't have, if your, if your key distribution is not super, super skewed, where all, you know, 1 billion attributes have the exact same, you know, key, then it might, might be okay. All right. So let's see how to do the, the, the first approach with the pending the record ID, right? So now the, again, in, in our values was always the key by the record ID, but now for all of our, uh, anytime we insert something, the real key, the real key we're going to assert is always going to be the, you know, the, the key itself followed by the record ID. So now what, if I want to assert six, I already have six. I'm not showing that we're, we're adding the, the record ID, but now the, the new six we're inserting is, is, is treated as unique because the rec, the, the page number, and the slot number will be the same, uh, for the new entry. Pretty straightforward. I think this is how Postgres does it. So, all right, so if I have now a, uh, if I would do overflow nodes, I want to assert six again. Basically, I find, I traverse the tree, find the leaf node it should be in, and then I just tack on a little pointer that says, oh, by the way, here's another page that has additional, additional keys that should map to this location. All right, and as I said, if I keep inserting keys that go to the same location, uh, it just gets fill, filled up like this. And at some point, if I insert a new key that would maybe it would, would be within this range, like 6.5, I would recognize that that value is distinct from the duplicates I have in here, and therefore now I should split following the protocol from before. Yes? Why don't I keep the overflow page for here? The question, why don't I keep the what, sorry? I keep the overflow page. Oh, his question is, why don't I keep the overflow page sorted? Uh, does that help you or hurt you? Um, <laughs> well, no, it would make lookups faster. Oh, it would definitely make it could make uh, make insertion slower because they may have to like cascade, right? Like if I insert six point five, this thing is long. Now everybody's got to get slid over, slid over by one. So yeah, so if you're doing this, you you want to keep it unsorted. Yes. When you insert six, why don't we do a split? The question, his question is, if what if I insert six, why don't I do a split? Because like the think of these as sort of is like logically these are sort of one leaf node, right? Uh, and because I'm not appending the record ID here, that there's, I would have this problem where I could have six up above, and it could be actually on the left and the right. Yeah, but I mean, I understand if, you, if all the three numbers are six, and in, the, in that case, it's down to the left here, you only have six, seven, eight. Why don't you do split? I mean, I mean, his statement is like, because I have six, seven, eight, I could could split and put the two sixes and one leaf node together. Yeah. Yes, you could, but I'm for. I'm just trying to vision, you know, demonstrate that what this overflow thing actually does. In the back, yes. Um, if you split the leaf nodes, do you split the key? His question is, if I split the leaf nodes, do I split the overflow, overflow nodes as well? Yes. So it may be the case that after a split, the new leaf node might be also overflow as well. Yes. So in principle, basically, the key within the B plus tree is the column attribute, right? And then they point to the actual 
Correct, yes. So the statement is the keys, when we use a B plus tree for indexes, the, the keys are the attributes within the table, and then the value is, a, is either a pointer to the tuple or the actual tuple itself. And yes? The, in this case, why not have like a linked list structure for each of those attributes? Let's say you can just have like a, okay, this is a string. If you give it another string, then it becomes like a, a chain and it is like two chains. Uh, so the statement is if. if So the statement is it's basically the, I showed the example before of the um, composition of a, or the page. This guy back here, right? Yeah. So I had the, the values, and I assumed it was one-to-one -one mapping from a key to a value, uh, and that this is just an array. So you're basically saying I could have the key point to an, uh, an array in, within my page, but here's all the values for this. You could do it that way too. Oh. Yeah. But at some point it could overflow as well. Okay. Um. All right. So let's go a little bit deeper now. What else we can do with the, with the B plus trees? So uh, you have a notion of what's called a clustered index, where this is you're sorting a table based on some specific order of, of the primary key. Right, and this guy had to be the 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 MySQL approach where I said where the, the leaf nodes actually store the tuples themselves, right? When, since you get that for free, uh, or you could tell the data system, okay, the this table is was originally un, unsorted, but now make it sorted based on this given index. And anytime you do an update or delete or an insert, the data system will try to maintain the uh, that it has to enforce that that sort sort order, right? So not all data systems support this. Uh, we can see an example on Postgres in a second. Postgres has the cluster command. You can tell it to cluster the table based on an index, and it'll do it once for you, but it won't actually actively maintain it over time. Yes? Uh, is there a use for specify by the primary key? Uh, is there a specific primary key that might be better or worse, or does it not matter? Uh, your question is, is there a specific primary key that might be better or worse? What do you mean by that? Every table can only have one primary key. Right. Uh, but, uh, is, is there a type of primary key that would be better? Uh, like based on what the attribute types are, are they integers or strings or whatever? Uh, it's not specific to cluster indexes, but certainly having indexes on integers would be way faster than integers on strings. Right. Okay. right? So that's one way to think about it. So some data systems support uh, support uh, indexes that aren't the primary key. Yeah. yeah, there's secondary indexes. Yeah. But are they sorted based on that as well? When, which, when you say, what is the is the is the are the tuple sorted based on that? No, you can only if, there's, if it if you have a clustered index for your table, the table be, can only be sorted in one key, right? Or or whatever whatever that index is. If you have a uh, you can build a secondary index, and that can be sorted anyway on any attribute you want. Any, actually, any direction, like sending or descending. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Yes. The entire tree, it would be like stored in memory. Is that why we are able to like pass it back to the cluster? This question is: Is the primary, is the entire tree able to be stored, able to be stored in memory? And that's why we can have fast lookups. I mean, fast from asymptotically log in is fast, but there's no guarantee that those pages will be in memory, right? My example I said at the beginning of class, like I, nothing. The data system won't, won't stop me if I say build an index, build a thousand indexes on a table. It'll do it for me, right? Whether it all fit in memory depends on the hardware, depends on the access patterns of the queries. There's no guarantee. In, in, a, in a production system, you want it all to be in memory, right? So you, you, you'd pay for a DBA or some kind of automated tool to try to figure that, out, that balance for you. Yes? This question is, is every single index you build specific to a table? Like it's not a clustering approach in memory, it's just for that particular case. Uh, it basically, can, can you have multiple, this question is, can, basically he's asking, can you have multiple, can an index reference multiple tables? How would that work? I mean, if they share a common attribute, I could see, could 
But what's in the leaf nodes? I have values that point to what? Different tables. But for what table? For the different tables. <laughs> uh, but how would I know what table? You'd have to put some metadata to say what table I'm looking up on. What about like an aggregation for all the, like for all the uh, three, four, eight, all the table that have corresponding aggregation? Or does that just doesn't make any sense? Uh, yeah. From what we're talking about here, it doesn't make sense. The way you, we're not going to talk about inverted indexes, but basically, some of the NoSQL guys, you can almost think of like a search engine. Find me all the tuples that have this string in it. Uh, and if you just put everything in a giant table, then it, it would work the like way you're describing. Yeah. But in, in a, for the relational model, I, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, so his question is, if I if I build an index on every single column in my table, would that be the same thing as index storage? Maybe. So when you talk about this S class, there's a notion of what's called a covering index. A covering index is, um, for my query, if I can get all the, the data I need to, for that query, if I can get it from the index, then you don't have to go look at the original tuple. Right? So it'd be a a shitty way to do the index organized table, but you could potentially do it that way. But when you update that, when you update that tuple, you're still gonna, go, you're still gonna have to go update the original table. So yeah, that's like, you could do it, it's a bad idea. I mean, but it depends. All right, since we're not gonna get through, uh, I mean, actually, so let me, let me quickly show, um, not this. All right, so basically a cluster B plus three looks like this. Again, we have our, our table pages, they're unsorted, um, and we have some, some B plus tree up above, right? And this is gonna guarantee that the, the ordering of the, of the tuples in the pages will be based on the, based on whatever the key specifies, right? Or sorry, the index ever specifies. You don't have to use a, a, uh, a, a clustered index to get this benefit as well. Um, so this is the, sort of the example he was asking, could I have an index, could I have multiple indexes that have their own different sort ordering that's different than how the, the, the table is actually sorted? Uh, and the answer is yes. But the challenge is gonna be that if I blindly follow the, the pointers that the, of the values that the, that the index is pointing to, if I just go fetch them all like in, a, in the order that they show up in the index, then that actually may not be that efficient. This is getting a little into, into query execution. Um, but it, this is sort of a simple optimization we can talk about now. So I have my index. It's, 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 I'm scanning across the leaf nodes. Uh, but now my pointers point to different random pages, right? Because the index is based on a different key than maybe how my, my tuples are sorted on uh, physically in the, in the pages. So if I blindly follow the, the pointers in the order that, that the data sees them as it scans along, I may end up doing something really stupid where I go fetch a page uh, and then immediately throw it away because I'm running out of memory space, and then I end up in my in this same query, going fetching the page over and over again, right, redundantly, which is wasteful. So I really saw optimization is I just do my scan first, figure out all the pages I'm going to need to touch, sort them uh, based on the page ID, and then then scan through in that order. So that guarantees that I'm only going to ever go fetch uh, one page once and only once for this query. All right, so in this, since we only have 10 minutes left, we'll have to cover those stuff next class. But let's, let's do a quick demo, which is always fun. All right, so um, for this demo, I have a table that's, that's already preloaded that has um, a bunch of email addresses. So, uh, so this is actually, uh, it's 27 million emails from the Ashley Madison uh, hack, breach, or whatever you want to call it, uh, <laughs> from a few years ago. They made it available on BitTorrent, so here it is. Um, <laughs> So I've preloaded, uh, what's that? Sorry, I've, I've already created two indexes. I have a hash index and a, and a, uh, and a B plus tree index on the emails. So in uh, Postgres, uh, if you just say, um, well, shoot. Uh, you call create index, you specify what table you want to build the index on and what columns you want to build it on. Um, and if, in Postgres, if you add this using B tree clause, then you're, you're you're guaranteed to get a, get a B tree. Um, the situation that they don't do a B tree? Yes, if you tell it not to. 
So by default, if you just write this, I want to build a index on, on email. Again, 99% of the data systems that are out there will give you a B plus tree. But you can, you can specifically tell Postgres, I want a B plus tree. Um, if you want a hash index in Postgres, you say this. And you, add, you add using hash at the end, and this, this is about a, about a hash table. Again, for 27 emails, it's going to take a little while to do this, so I've already preloaded it. Um, so let me also turn off a bunch of other optimizations, which we don't care about now. Um, so if I want to get the, the minimum email, right, it comes back pretty quickly, and I can run explain to figure out what it did. So in this case here, uh, this is actually the covering index I talked about before. So it's doing index-only scan, meaning it only looks at the index to find the answer to the question I need or the, the, the data that I need. Again, the beauty of the relational model in SQL is that the data system knows my select query, all they want are emails. And so this, there's an index on the B, B plus tree. The B plus tree index already has the email, so I never have to go look at, at the original tuple. right? So this is super, super fast. So is, this one knew that all I need to do an index scan to traverse down to the left side of the tree, because it's in that sorted order, and I can immediately produce the answer that, that I'm looking for. right? But now if I want to try to do something more complicated, like I want to find uh, an email that begins with foo, right? it takes kind of a, a while to run and produce a bunch of results. We don't care about the results, but we see what the query plan is. What's that? Oh, his email's in there? Maybe. Uh, there are actually some email ones in there. Um, it's not me. Uh, right, so in this case here, I'm doing, you know, trying to look up where find me all emails where it starts with the prefix foo. I have a B plus tree that I could do this on, right? But it chose to still do a sequential scan because the data system has this, this optimizer tries to figure out what would be the cost of doing a sequential scan versus index scan. And it decided that foo is somewhere in the middle of, of the values. The better, I'm better off just scanning through the entire table than trying to use the index for this, right? Let's do another one here. We can do a with a, uh, this one is trying to say where email equals zero, zero, some other fake thing, and then some other random dude in Hotmail, right? In this case here, Postgres decides it's now going to use the hash index. Now we have a disjunction with an equality predicate with the, the entire value of the key that we're looking for. So it's going to do the first lookup in the hash index with the first, for the first predicate, then it runs it again for the second predicate, and then this is called a bit, bitmap index scan. But Ignore the bitmap part. Basically, it did a probe once, find the entry that it wants, did another probe again, find another entry, and it now knows those are the two pages that it has the data that I need to go fetch. That's sort of that optimization I saw before. And then it says, all right, take, takes, the, uh, takes the or of them, finds all the, the pages that need to touch, and then goes, fetches them, and just finds the exact data that, that we're looking for. Right? So that's a good example where, again, where the, the data system, can, 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 within a single query, can probe it multiple times. And in this one here, it chose to use the hash index because, you know, it's on average 01, so it's, it, that's much faster than using a B plus tree. So now we do another one where you want to say, uh, find all emails that uh, were greater than Andy. I think we need to be like this. In this case here, it chose to do the sequential scan again because we're on the, the left side of the tree. And we have to do all these leaf node scans, and it's just faster just due to the sequential scan. So I try to pick something on the, the uppermost portion of the, of, the, of the key space, like ZZZ. Now I recognize, aha, the thing you're looking for is actually, uh, the, the range scan actually will be much smaller, because I, I know roughly the, the distribution of values. So I'll jump to the left, the right side of the tree, and I have to scan across, and the index scan is faster. So it chooses that. So. Let's see now about a clustering index. So I go ask it, what's the minimum CTID of, of this table? And it's 0, 1. It's page 0, offset 1, right? slot 1. But if I go look actually what those values are, let's just keep it simple. Let's, say, let's get the first four values, right? where CTID is 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. So go find the first, the first page, 0, and give me the first four values. right? You can see it's a bunch of random email addresses. right? So this is showing us that the data is actually not in sorted. Like I, I, I randomized or I shuffled the uh, randomly sorted the data before I inserted it, and Postgres just inserted it in, in the way in the order that they were insert, inserted them into the pages in the order that they appeared in the file that I loaded, right? 
So there's a command in Postgres, as I said before, called cluster. I'm not going to run it because it's going to take it's going to take a while, right? It's basically going to copy out the. Uh, it's going to make a new version of the table, uh, and then it's going to sort them or do do a range, do the leaf node scan and sort them back into the table, uh, based on the order that they appear in the index. So I already have one that's already pre-populated. Um, you know, clustered. Or email, sorry. Right, it has it has the same values as before with all, all 27, million, 27 million emails. So now if I do that same query that I had before, where I said, go get me the first four entries in the first page on my clustered one. Actually, no, so that, that's the unclustered. So let's do the same thing on the clustered. Now you see, because I ran that cluster command, it, it, it reinserted the back of the table in that order. But as I said, some data sets will maintain things in that sort of order. Postgres does not. When you call a cluster command, it's a one-time operation, and it won't, won't maintain things in the sort of order going forward. And I can test this because I'll delete the first entry, right? this fake email address with zeros. right? And if I run that, uh, check to what's in when the first four slots, now you see that, again, zero, 01 is missing. It's empty. right? It hasn't reused it yet. If I now insert it back in, I do my lookup before uh, like this. It's not there. Um, so now I want to go get it. Select CTID, star from emails clustered, where email equals this guy. Right? Now it's some, some page 299 out of offset 146. Right? So even though I told Postgres I want to, I want to use a cluster table or cluster my table in this index, it's not maintaining it for me. Yes? Does mostly to speed up reads going forward? This question is, is this mostly to speed up reads going forward? Yes. Is the Postgres property the opposite? This, yeah, this question is, is this the Postgres property? Do others not have this problem? Correct, yes. Uh, we could load the data up in MySQL. Since MySQL, if we, actually, if we, if we build the primary key on the email addresses, then my SQL would, would would guarantee it's always in sort of order. Yes. So even though logically, like the email research encoder is supposed to be at the start of each page, if you don't cluster it, then same argument would fail in any scenario. Yes. Yeah, so statement is, and again, this this is the important thing to understand. I said at the beginning, the statement is, even though logically the email address should appear at the 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 right the left leftmost side of the tree because it's the smallest value. Postgres is not guaranteeing that's going to appear in that order on the pages. Correct. Again, the index is like a replica of the table. It can have its own physical properties and do whatever you want with it uh, that, and, and that's completely separate than what the table is. But it always has to have the underlying table like because that's, that's the sort of the, 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 how say this, the primary value or the, 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 the master values of those tuples. Uh, so, so the statement is, even though they're logically the same, the cluster command guarantees that the, 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 the table pages with the tuples will be in the same sort order as the index, yes. But in case of MySQL, or sorry, in case of Postgres, they won't maintain it for you. So sometimes you see people running like, like Tron jobs every Saturday, they'll run the cluster command, or every night they run cluster command for the, for the next day. Statement is, it seems very expensive to do insert if you want to maintain the cluster if you're not storing the, the tuples in the leaf pages, like MySQL is. The answer is yes. So if you want to get good performance for a sequential read, you better use a cluster index. So question is, if you want to get good performance for a sequential read, uh, you wouldn't use a cluster index. Well, no. Like, you could do this for... Uh, depends on what the query is, right? So let's actually look... We have time quickly to do this. Let's do. Here we go. All right. So the statement is: does, if you're doing a lot of sequential reads, do you need a cluster index? No, because it depends on what the command is. And if it's OLAP, you're doing nothing but sequential, you know, sequential reads anyway, and you want to look at everything uh, anyway. All right. So I have two terminals here. 
on, on this side we have SQLite. On this other side we have DuckDB. DuckDB is a column store uh, that has a vectorized engine, has a whole bunch of other stuff we'll cover later in the semester. But SQLite you guys used for uh, in first homework, right? So I think this one is query four, right? So just trying to get the name of the count of people that appeared uh, based on number of appearances, right? So SQLite on my box here takes about 17 seconds. Query. But let's use DuckDB. Same query, right? Half a second. So the in this case here, I'm, I'm basically doing an entire sequential scan on the table or with the join. Uh, there's other optimizations that'll make DuckDB faster before SQLite, before the, even the clustered index. There's nothing in my in my query here that that would take advantage of the clustered index anyway, right? Again, so what is the exact reason DuckDB is faster? I think it's a combination of column store, it's vectorized, we'll cover that in a second. It's doing, uh, I think they're also doing query compilation, and it's actually probably doing parallel execution as well. So everything. So is the clustered index going to make a huge difference for, uh, for OLAP? Probably not. Col column store would be a big, bigger difference. Okay? All right, so there's a bunch of things we didn't get through. Uh, We'll cover that. We'll cover at the beginning of next class. So we'll spend the next class talking about the different design choices and optimizations we can do. Okay? All right, hit it. Snake.